disastrous failure of their mission. The curtain opens on the final act of Vlasov's tragic story. While the 1st Division marches to their deployment on the Oder River under Commander Bunyachenko, Vlasov's staff is moved from Berlin to Karlsbad in Bohemia. The Hotel Richmond becomes their headquarters. In view of the impending German defeat, Vlasov decides, without the knowledge of his German allies, that the remaining troops under his command should assemble in Bohemia. The aim of this manoeuvre is to strengthen the hand of the Russian liberation movement regarding the Western Allies, in the hope of preventing the threatened repatriation. On April the 13th, near Furstenberg, south of Frankfurt on the Oder, the 1st Division is to storm a Red Army bridgehead on the west bank of the river. Vlasov's troops alternate between naive hope and resignation. It was all the same to us. We were the people who had already had it up to here, who had been vagabonds from 1941 to 1945. It was all the same to us who we had to fight. When we received an order, we had to obey. That's the way we thought at the time. If we got shot in the process, that would also be all right. That was a chance, the first chance, to get rid of this satanic regime. This regime had cost countless human lives and brought the country vast misery. Therefore, committing fratricide was a tolerable decision. This decision was in no way easy to make. But you have to know, we thought at the time that our major weapon would be words. Today I know that this belief was pretty naive. The battle is soon over. In the face of the Red Army's military superiority, the 1st Division's attack fails. Bunyachenko doesn't want to use up his troops as cannon fodder. After only a day, he orders them to withdraw toward Bohemia. Bunyachenko said, I have the impression the Germans expected more. But what more could you want than that my soldiers are ready to die? And they did die. Apparently unmoved by the fate of his soldiers, on that very day Vlasov marries Adelheid Bielenberg in Karlsbad. His Russian wife had been arrested following Vlasov's defection and at this very moment was imprisoned in one of the camps of the Gulag archipelago. For me, that's a blemish you'd like to be able to erase, <laughs> to wipe away. In the last weeks of the war, an organized deployment of Vlasov's divisions can no longer be considered. More and more individual units are being captured by the Western Allies. Chaos makes for almost absurd bedfellows. At the request of Czech nationalists, at the beginning of May, the 1st Division moves into Prague to fight with the civilian population against the German occupation forces. Nobody ever received us like they did in Prague. The bakeries were open and they brought us fresh bread. They helped us to carry our equipment. They gave us the same welcome as they gave the Red Army later. You must have seen the pictures in the cinema. The popular uprising in Prague reaches its climax on May the 6th. In the streets of Prague, 
Fierce gun battles erupt between German soldiers and Czech civilians. On the edge of the city, Vlasov soldiers engage in combat with SS units stationed there. The German occupation forces capitulate. But immediately afterward, the Czech National Council demands Bunyashenko leave Prague with his division. Für einen bestimmten Kreis von der tschechischen Regierung waren die ROA in Prague. The ROA in Prague was of assistance to a certain group in the Czech government. Für einen anderen Teil der, des Nationalrates war das compromised another part of the National Council. Eine andere Russen sind nach Prague. These Russians coming to the aid of Prague were not the ones in their scenario, in, in the Red Army. Before the Red Army reaches Prague on May the 9th, the 1st Division withdraws to the west. On May the 12th, they reach Schlüsselberg in Bohemia. This is where, two days previously, Vlasov has surrendered to the Americans. The Americans refuse to grant asylum to Vlasov and his troops. After consulting with Vlasov, Bunyachenko dissolves the 1st Division. While most of Vlasov's 10,000 soldiers fatalistically await capture by the Red Army, some individual groups push through the American lines to the west. On the same day, Vlasov is to be brought to the US Army headquarters for interrogation. But just outside Schlüsselberg, the American convoy is stopped by a Soviet patrol. Vlasov is taken into custody. Shortly afterward, he is flown to Moscow and, after exhaustive interrogation, he is imprisoned by the Soviet secret police. Now that the war has ended, about 80,000 soldiers of the erstwhile Russian Liberation Army are held as displaced persons in camps run by the Western Allies. In addition, there are several Cossack units, notorious partisan fighters, who had been first put under Vlasov's command in 1945. In the British internment camp at Canton in Austria, the soldiers hope right up to the last moment to escape being turned over to the Soviets. The general mood in both the government and the people of England was not sympathetic to the Vlasov people. I mean, they were frankly regarded as people who had, who had either helped or wanted to help our common enemy, who was Hitler, and therefore, in a sense, traitors. At the beginning of June, the British Army begins the handover. There are wrenching scenes. Gradually, we managed to, by brutal force really, force them out of the camp. Then they linked arms and sat on the ground and said, we're not moving from here. So again, force had to be used. Not only soldiers are being repatriated, but also women and children. Among them, Zoe Polanska, then 15 years old. They started to pull us apart from the crowd. And it was a huge stampede where people were tramped on. Some of them died, some of them wounded. Shots were fired. We really didn't know what was happening. I saw one lady, um, obviously a Cossack lady, she got the traditional long black skirt on and a, a shawl over her head, but she got her, what appeared to me to be a bundle of white clothes, which she suddenly struck on the bridge, twice on the bridge, grabbed the bundle in her arms and then jumped off the bridge into the raging river and was washed away. As we cross over the river drow, left and right, full of people drowning, just like autumn leaves, little heads bobbing in and out. And a lot of 
some lying dead or dead. I couldn't stand it any longer and I shouted an order to stop this brutality. But I think at the same moment, the, the Cossacks decided, well, you know, we've got to go. And things calmed down and they started rather reluctantly going and getting into the back of the truck. In the American camps, like here in Platling in Bavaria, the repatriation is only begun months after the end of the war. Hope spreads among the captive members of the former Vlasov army. Many of them thought it was only a matter of time, and a short time at that, before the Americans would be at war with the Soviets, and they would be fighting uh, with the Americans. However, the U.S. abides strictly by the Yalta Agreement. The U.S. military does not want to endanger the repatriation of American prisoners of war who have fallen into Soviet hands. Therefore, in August 1945, they begin to transfer their Russian prisoners. In desperation, many try to commit suicide. Most of the passengers on these trains rolling east will be quickly sentenced to years, decades in labor camps. Nikolai Chikatov is one of the few who survives this punishment. I told them all then that we'd be paid off with Siberia. We were all guilty in some way. Andrei Andreevich Vlasov and 11 of his closest officers are tried by the Military Council of the Supreme Court of the USSR in Moscow. On July the 30th, 1946, they are sentenced to be hanged. The sentence is carried out the next day.